One of the most important assumptions of this course is that the most effective prose establishes a relationship between writer and reader. That's a relationship between two people, two distinct personalities. If our writing doesn't offer some glimpses of writers as personalities, it's hard to say that it has a style, much less that its style will appeal to readers. As I noted in the last lecture, if our writing displays no more of the way we think, the ways in which we process information, than does objective technology, such as that we might find in a security camera at a convenience store, it probably doesn't matter that what we write accurately records and reports information. That's the difference between a writer and a security camera. The security camera only records what takes place in front of its lens, while the writer thinks about, reflects upon, forms opinions about, and frequently comments on what he or she is writing about. Another way of putting this assumption is for me to argue that our writing is purpose-driven. And almost always we have multiple purposes when we write. We write to accomplish a, a wide variety of goals and very, very rarely is our primary goal only to record or to report. We record and report in order to accomplish larger purposes. And those larger purposes shape the way in which we approach the task of recording and reporting. Choosing what to include, choosing what to exclude, organizing our presentation of information to best suit our purposes. And one of the important purposes that we should always have in mind when we write is, as Joan Didion so powerfully put it in her celebrated essay on keeping a notebook, remember what it was to be me. That is always the point. Now, Didion was specifically meditating on keeping a notebook or a journal and not on writing in general, but I think her reminder serves all writers in, serves all writers in good stead, applying to greater or lesser degree to almost everything we write. She was definitely not offering a brief for solipsism, even in notebook writing, or even arguing that the writer should primarily be concerned with remembering and conveying their personality in everything they write. She was, I believe, reminding herself and us that writing is one of the most distinctly human activities, and that like all human knowledge, it inherently, inevitably, and gloriously involves acts of interpretation. If that were not the case, there would be no difference between the human writer and the mechanical security camera. If we scale down this large philosophical assumption to the level of the sentences we write, it suggests we should be concerned not just with the accuracy and clarity of what we write, but that we should also be concerned with making our writing a reflection of who we are, how we think, what we value. The style of our writing is determined by a huge number of variables, but one aspect of that style should always be that our writing present us as individual consciousnesses, as personalities who process the information we pass on in our writing rather than as automatons who only record, report, or summarize information as if it were being spewed out by a machine, or even worse, by a committee. Sure, there are some writing situations where we want to submerge our individuality in the collective prose of a committee, and there are some situations when we might want our writing to pretend to the accuracy and objectivity of a mechanical recording device, although I'm hard-pressed to think of situations where we would want that to be the case. But here, as elsewhere in this course, I'm referring to writing as 
a discovery process in which writers find out things about themselves even as they write for specific audiences with specific purposes in mind. My definition of writing always includes the processing of information by the writer's mind, a requirement that distinguishes writing from copying, from repeating, from mere recording and reporting. We signal that we're processing information in our writing in a number of ways, several of which we've already been exploring in this course. The cumulative syntax itself signals our determination to get it right, to extend the detail and explanation in our writing further, to take one more crack at making as clear as possible what we're trying to communicate using cumulative modifying phrases to sharpen our images and to better reveal our reasoning. In the last lecture, I suggested that the cumulative syntax can also prompt us to include similes and metaphors in our writing, particularly similes that compare what we are writing about with something else. The comparison, both offering another perspective on or way of thinking about our subject, and offering a window onto the way our own thinking works, a glimpse of our intellectual personality, our individuality, our style. Now, I want to suggest another way in which the cumulative syntax can serve to prompt us to reveal more about our thinking, more about the character characteristic ways in which we process information. One step beyond making the comparisons, as similes do, between two things or situations that are different, and sometimes quite different, is for us to speculate about that which is not known. Indeed, some similes are already well on their way beyond comparison and into speculation. As we can see in this passage from John Updike's well-known short story, A and P, where the protagonist, Sammy, is describing a striking young girl in a bathing suit who, along with two friends, has just entered the grocery store where he's a checker. Quote, She didn't look around, not this queen. She just walked straight on, slowly, on these long, white, prima donna legs. She came down a little hard on her heels, as if she didn't walk in her bare feet that much putting down her heels and then letting the weight move along to her toes as if she was testing the floor with every step, putting a little deliberate extra action into it. Now, both of the as-if comparisons Updike offers in this last sentence reveal Sammy's speculation as he tries to account for the girl's noteworthy way of walking. Both of these similes are actually offered more tentatively than authoritatively, presented as possible comparisons, possible explanations. Two sentences from Joyce Carol Oates's Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? suggest the degrees of difference between a simile that primarily advances a comparison and one that primarily advances a speculation. He spoke in a simple, lilting voice, exactly as if he were reciting the words to a song. That seems firmly grounded in an easily visualized comparison. But consider this sentence. She looked at it for a while as if the words meant something to her that she did not yet know. Now that seems to be a simile of quite different sort, offering much more speculation than it offers actual comparison. We signal such speculation in lots of different ways, but I'll just focus on three of these signals, the words because, possibly, and perhaps. I, I've chosen these words because they also lend themselves to the step logic and downshifting rhythms of the cumulative syntax. And that also means that they lend themselves to becoming generative challenges or heuristic prompts in the way the cumulative syntax does so distinctively and so well. Consider these sentences. 
The dog froze in place, ears up to detect the slightest sound, eyes riveted on the clump of brush, possibly sensing danger. Or, cumulative syntax prompts us to add information to our sentences, reminding us that there's always more to say, more detail or explanation that will make our writing more clear, possibly serving as a silent voice, a kind of personal writing trainer, urging us to go for that extra level of meaning, to push ourselves to anticipate a reader's possible questions about what we've just written, always thinking about the benefits of having our sentences take that extra step. Or, he suddenly ran off the stage, possibly because he'd forgotten his lines, possibly because he had just noticed the audience for the first time, perhaps even because he was in some physical distress. Each of these sentences goes beyond stating what is known to suggest motivations or causes that remain speculative. Each sentence attempts to explain the image, idea, or situation it references, revealing that the writer wants to be helpful, wants to account for things as well as possible, wants to further engage the reader in the effort to make the best sense possible of the information provided by the sentence. Each sentence gives us a glimpse of the way the writer thinks about the world in general and the subject of his or her writing in particular. My pitch is that adding speculation concerning motive behind cause of or interpretation of the events or actions we write about helps forge the connection between reader and writer as two minds at work. Obviously, speculations introduced by words such as possibly or perhaps will not be appropriate in many writing situations. But knowing how well the cumulative syntax lends itself to speculative phrases introduced by these words may prompt us to consider whether or not to use them. After all, just knowing how easily we can add speculation to our writing may encourage us to put a bit more of the way we think into our writing, possibly forging a stronger relationship with a reader who appreciates our willingness to go beyond the just the facts ma'am literalness of Sergeant Joe Friday and Dragnet, perhaps signaling our readers that it is as important to wonder why and how things happen as it is to know what happens. Here, of course, I'm thinking of writing situations where it is as important to present our judgment, our ability to interpret, our commitment to understanding as it is to present unprocessed information. In this advocacy for making cumulative step speculation an option in our writing, I'm applying to writing the advice Margaret Atwood gives to readers in her didactic short story, Happy Endings. In that minimalist meditation on possible plots involving various relationships among briefly sketched lovers, Atwood urges readers to focus less on plots, which she describes as, quote, just one thing after another, a what and a what and a what, end quote, her advice is, quote, now try how and why. I think that's great advice for writers as well. And in the cases when the how and why of a situation have not been and possibly cannot be determined, it frequently benefits the writer to move beyond the known to speculate about the likely or even just the possible. Consider these sentences. The fire spread quickly, its flames fanned by the stiff breeze, consuming the small apartment in minutes, possibly the result of a candle left burning too close to blowing curtains. Now, some cumulative sentences place a second-level modifying phrase just after the first clause in a compound sentence and just before the second clause, as in this sentence from E.B. White. They damned the falls, shutting out the tide, and dug a pit so deep you could look down and see China. 
possibly using that middle modifying phrase as a kind of hinge, turning the sentence in a new direction. Thomas Berger remains one of America's most celebrated underread authors, a writer whose books enjoy rave reviews, but whose sales and numbers rarely rise above respectable, possibly because his fiction consistently resists the twin sentimentalities of idealism and despair. Linguistic theory tells us that the last or the next to last step or slot in the sentence generally is the place in the sentence where we want to put the most in intonational stress. As Martha Colne exp explains in her chapter on sentence rhythm in her rhetorical grammar, grammatical choices, rhetorical effects, this well-recognized rhythm pattern is called end focus, and it gives rhythmic emphasis to information at the end or near the end of the sentence. Indeed, Professor Strunk had already intuited this principle in 1919 as his 22nd and final principle of composition in his little book was place the emphatic words of a sentence at the end. I have mixed feelings about this advice, particularly when it is used to make the claim that periodic or suspensive sentences are somehow superior to loose or right-branching cumulative sentences. The truth is we can shape our sentences so that we can emphasize any part of them we want to, and that emphasis is rhetorical rather than grammatical, determined by the context and purpose of the sentence rather than by its grammatical form. To his great credit, Professor Strunk acknowledged that truth by qualifying his end-of-sentence advice, explaining, quote, the proper place in the sentence for the word or group of words for that, uh, that the writer desires to make most prominent is usually the end, emphasis mine. Moreover, shortly thereafter, he adds that the, quote, other prominent position in the sentence is the beginning, emphasis mine again. The point we need to remember is that position by itself may or may not place emphasis, but the end position does generally tend to lend itself to emphasis. And that's why in the last lecture I suggested the advantages of using the final step of a cumulative sentence for a summative simile or a simile that recasts previous information in more dramatic and memorable form. And that's why in this lecture, I'm suggesting the advantages of using the final step of a cumulative sentence for speculation about motive or likely consequences or cause. Speculation signaled by the words because, possibly, or perhaps. Of these heuristic prompts, because sounds a lot more certain than does possibly or perhaps, and because is a subordinating conjunction, almost always introducing a subordinate clause rather than a modifying phrase. But I group these words together because they serve very similar informational functions, and they so frequently appear in combination. We can see how they work in combination in sentences such as the guard fainted, dropping his rifle, crumbling at the feet of the queen, perhaps because he had been standing in the blazing sun for hours, or as in, we all dropped the class, possibly because we couldn't see how it would help us make our fortunes, possibly because its instructor spoke very rapidly in a shrill, high voice, possibly because we were not convinced of the value of deconstructing old episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or possibly because it was at 7.30 in the morning. Of course, the cumulative syntax also invites the placement of speculative phrases in the initial or medial slots of the sentence, but as has been my practice so far, I've focused on the final slot simply to take full advantage of the generative power of the cumulative, its final modifying phrase always reminding us of the option of coming up with a simile or speculation that might provide a new perspective 
or offer a summation of what has gone before in the sentence, both options also giving us a chance to reveal more of the way we process information in our writing. Nor do the heuristic prompts I've singled out exhaust the possibilities for introducing such speculation. Indeed, for and as can be used interchangeably with because. He knew that calling for help was useless, a waste of breath, because no one lived for miles around. He knew that calling for help was useless, a waste of breath, for no one lived for miles around. Or, he knew that calling for help was useless, a waste of breath, as no one lived for miles around. Obviously, none of these variations is a cumulative phrase in strict grammatical sense. But if the clause introduced by because or by causal uses of for or as come to us at the end of phrases that have established the cumulative rhythm, they work cumulatively, plugging into the rhetorical advantages and opportunities cumulative syntax offers us. I'm also not sure that any significant difference exists among these three sentences. But I suspect each of us gravitates toward one of these options more than we use the other two. And I further suspect we do so because we sense at least connotative differences among the three. To my ear, for in place of because sounds just a bit old, archaic, possibly poetic. At the very least, using for in place of because, that is, using it as a conjunction, may lead to some confusion if a second for appears in the sentence, this time serving as a preposition. We can see this happen in a sentence from Joan Didion's essay on keeping a notebook. Responding to complaints from members of her family that her memories of shared events are frequently in error, she acknowledges, very likely they are right, for not only have I always had trouble distinguishing between what happened and what merely might have happened, but I remain unconvinced that the distinction, for my purposes, matters. As, in place of because, sounds a tad smug to me. She didn't come to the party as we had not invited her. As a matter of fact, as is a word with as many different uses as to stun those of us who don't think systematically, perhaps obsessively, about language. Indeed, Fowler's modern English usage identifies a whopping 13 different ways or senses in which the word as can be used. I mention this only because it is from little choices, such as those concerning our choice between as and for, that from which we build individual writing styles, and as much as possible, I'd like my own writing style to be the result of conscious choices that I can, if need be, explain even though those choices have become so habitual or so natural for me that I certainly am no longer conscious of them when I write. Nor, of course, are possibly or perhaps the only words we can use to signal speculation. Maybe would serve the same purpose, or we might choose probably to signal a greater degree of confidence in our speculation. And should we wish to move beyond speculation to offer an explanation that puts distance between our thinking and apparent or received truth, we might wish to introduce our summative cumulative modifying phrase with a word such as likely, a phrase such as more likely, or a word as insistent as actually. Here's an example. The guard fainted, dropping his rifle, crumbling at the feet of the queen, 
likely a casualty of poor training and poor conditioning. Another. The guard fainted, dropping his rifle, crumbling at the feet of the queen, more likely a sign of his nervousness than of exhaustion. And one more. The guard fainted, dropping his rifle, crumbling at the feet of the queen, actually reinforcing the view widely held by the press that these ceremonial inspections were pointless. And of course, the verbs most frequently associated with the kind of writerly speculation I'm advocating are seems and appears, the verbal participial forms of both, seeming and appearing, custom made for introducing speculative cumulative modifying phrases. Here's an example. Each essay explored another of the writer's fears, seeming to reveal an almost infinite number of pathologies, each appearing more threatening than the last. Another example. She built her business slowly, opening a new store only when its success was certain, seemingly incapable of miscalculations when assessing likely profits. Or another. The young novelist produced bestseller after bestseller, appearing to have stumbled on some magic formula for literary success. By this point in the lecture, I must seem less and less concerned with the production and inclusion in our writing just of cumulative sentences, and more and more concerned with ways in which we foreground ourselves in our writing as thinkers developing the ethical appeal of our writing. I've only begun to skim the surface of ways in which we can foreground ourselves and our writing as thinkers, as information processors. Obviously, there are an almost infinite number of ways we can call attention to ourselves as the consciousness, the personality behind what we write. We can use verbs of intellectual agency, verbs such as, I think, I believe, I know, or it seems to me. We can use phrases that self-consciously foreground our thinking, phrases such as, in my opinion, or the way I see it, and there are other ways, probably beyond counting, and certainly beyond systematic study to accomplish this important goal. For instance, listen to the way E.B. White makes his opinion very clear about the ethics of mining companies and this sentence from his essay, Letter from the East. The mining company soon milked the place dry of copper and zinc and got out the way mining companies do. If his choice of milked as a verb didn't establish his view of mining companies, the final cumulative modifying phrase, the way mining companies do, makes his disdain unmistakable. Indeed, I'm betting that each of us could come up with quite a list of ways in which we can signal in our writing the individuality of our thinking. What's more, I bet our lists would be quite different, yet another tribute to the diversity and multiplicity of language. Perhaps I should acknowledge once again that my approach to teaching writing does value very highly the ethos aspect of rhetorical situations, in part because those other two classic components of rhetoric, logos and pathos, strike me as much more beyond the effective reach of writing instruction, since they are always so context dependent. We may not be able to anticipate the logical or emotional context in which we must write, but we do always bring the same creative consciousness to the process of writing. We can always remember, as Joan Didion put it, what it meant to be me, or what it means to be me, and how we want to communicate to our readers our personality, our individuality, as the creative mind behind what we write. And we are now fast approaching an important turning point in this course. In the next lecture, I will make a final pass at stressing the importance of the rhythm of our sentences, particularly as cumulative syntax provides us with some fairly predictable ready-made rhythms.
But in lecture 14, we'll shift our focus from the cumulative syntax as a versatile and powerful armature on which we can build our writing style and begin looking at other syntax opportunities, some of which can still be approached, uh, can still be approached through cumulative techniques but some of which are nearly completely antithetical to the cumulative assumptions and practices to which I've devoted the first half of this course. It's time now for us to turn our attention to the delaying strategies of periodic or suspensive sentences and to the powerful rhythmic appeal and emphatic power of balanced forms and serial constructions. This does not mean, however, that we will suddenly abandon the cumulative moves we've been exploring. Instead, we will discover that the versatility of the cumulative sentence can also be extended to help us master these new forms, although cumulative syntax will now become only one of the many different means to the end of making our writing more effective.